Hello, I'm Helen Hunt Jackson, and this is my home. My given name was Helen Maria Fiske. I was reared in the East and raised by a very stern literary family, our father being a minister and a teacher. I was the second oldest of four children, both my brothers dying at infancy. As a young girl, I could only watch as our mother fought a losing battle with tuberculosis, leaving our father with two motherless daughters to raise, so we were sent to live with relatives. Shortly after our mother's death, our father joined a missionary in the Holy Land, where he died unexpectedly. But before he left, he made sure we would attend select boarding schools. As a young girl, I was impulsive. I questioned the unquestionable with a creative spirit. In 1852, I married Lieutenant Edward Vissel Hunt. A short year later, our son Murray was born, but died at infancy. It wasn't long before Rainey came along. He was a beautiful baby boy, an exceptional child. I gave him all my love. Edward and I were married 11 years when he was killed in an accident while working on an experimental underwater vessel. Rainey and I came down with diphtheria. I recovered, but Rainey, being of the youthful age of nine, didn't have the strength to pull through. I made him promise before he passed, if there was a way for him to contact me from the other side, that he would. And with this, I embraced spiritualism, and I attended seances. But I was never able to speak to my Rainey. So I had a very sad domestic career. In trying to overcome the sadness, I started to write. And I learned to do so with a friend and classmate of mine, Emily Dickinson. I started writing saleable poems and articles for some very liberal papers and magazines, such as Harper Magazine, Nation, Century Magazine, and the New York Tribune, oftentimes having to use a pen name because of sexual prejudice in my articles. I used names such as Saxy Holm, Rip Van Winkle. As I became braver, I used my initials, HH. And in writing in this way, I was referred to as an ink-stained woman. Spells of bronchial catarrh led me to move west, to seek out the mineral waters of Manitou Springs in the dry climate of Colorado. My doctor set me up in an area consisting of portable housing brought in from Chicago. The area was referred to as Dead Man's Row because of its invalid population. Shortly after my recovery, I met a handsome railroad gentleman by the name of William S. Jackson. He was part of the building and running of the Denver Rio Grande Railroad and a banker. And even though he was, I was five years older than he, he consistently wooed me until finally we married. And it was at our union, a friend of William's referred to us as the Union of Skylark and Turtle. Though I wasn't quite sure what he meant by that remark. Maybe it was because William was a thrifty Quaker and I, a metaphysical, unpredictable woman. William purchased a home for us from a carpenter named Winfield Stratton, who built it himself. But I couldn't live in the home until my front door faced my beloved Cheyenne Mountain. And with a few other alterations, it was very livable. I wasn't a mixer. The social set didn't intrigue me. But it was while I was back east on a visit, I attended a lecture where an Indian chief by the name of Standing Bear was speaking on behalf of his people. Now, I never wanted to be known as a woman with a cause, but this new interest touched me deeply. These Indians found themselves surrounded by and caught up in the middle of an influx of gold-seeking settlers. And after hearing of the indecent treatment of the Indians, I decided to write of the indictment on the American Indian policy, and I put it in a documented book form called A Century of Dishonor. It was a bitter, slashing, murderous declamation, and I put a copy on the desk of every member of Congress, and it sent Washington on its ear. Quite literally, I was a holy terror. On the cover of each book written in red was a quote from Benjamin Franklin. Look upon your hands. They're stained with the blood of your relations. Attacks upon my book were so severe, friends convinced me to take a trip abroad to escape the negative criticism. So I traveled to England and Scandinavia and Germany. I was known as William's globetrotting wife. It was hard being married to and loving the same man who was destroying the habitat of the Plains Indians with the railroad. So upon my return, I felt my mission was still not complete. So again, 
I wrote about the Indians. The government, in order to silence my pen, offered me the position of Commissioner of Indian Affairs. I was the first woman to hold that position. I was to report back to them on the missions and the Indian status. But my reports weren't taken seriously. I had to find another way to inform the public. I needed to touch their hearts. So I wrote Ramona. It was a romantic, sad novel about the Indians. You know, it makes little difference where one opens the history of the Indians. Every page, every year has a dark stain on it. The history of the government's connection with the Indians is a shameful record of broken treaties and unfulfilled promises. It was shortly after I finished Ramona, my health failed quickly, never quite recovering from a fall down my starry stairway, and cancer now taking over my life. But before I die, I'll write a letter to President Grover Cleveland asking him to please read my century of dishonor. I believe when I die, they'll find Indians engraved upon my brain, for a fire has been kindled within me that may never be put out. I had but a few requests of my William and of my friends. I asked of William, take me through Cheyenne Canyon and bury me high above the falls, where I spent so much time communicating with nature and writing. And to my friends I asked, take two stones from the canyon, leave one with me and take one in remembrance of me. Do not adorn me with costly shrub or tree or flower the little grave that shelters me. Let the wild wind-sown seeds grow up unharmed and back and forth all summer unalarmed. Let any little tiny creature creep. Oh, right of me, not died in bitter pains, but immigrated to another star.